Meeple Nation Podcast, Episode 345, Meeple Nation November News. Welcome, citizens of Meeple Nation. For the next 30 minutes, sit back and enjoy. Meeple Nation is sponsored by GameToppersLLC.com. If you are looking to improve your gaming area, we highly recommend picking up a Game Topper from GameToppersLLC.com. I know Logan has had a chance to come over and play on the Minecraft a few times. We've always enjoyed playing on the Watsons that, that Nathan has in his gaming area. We highly recommend it. It is so enjoyable to actually be able to play a game on something that looks great. The functionality is fantastic. Highly recommend it. GameToppersLLC.com. The only thing that I can really say that's bad about them is it's hard to go back to a regular table. And then after you go from the Mycroft, the Watson, you're just kind of like, this is so small. It is so nice to have that extra space. Especially for certain games that really take a lot of table space. Those big games are a lot easier to get to the table. I'm having a hard time even remembering how we played Firefly with the whole damn verse. It consumed everything. Still a little bit snug on the Watson when you're playing with four players. To go back to just our regular table, 36 inches wide. And like you said, Logan, I can't even imagine going back to playing at a regular table. So know that going in is that it will ruin all other tables for you. But in a good way. We're the hosts of Meeple Nation. I am Logan Howard. I am Andy Holiday. I am Nathan Howard. And I'm Dave Holiday. This week, November news. There's a lot of new games that have come out recently. We might be talking about more new games than Kickstarters. No matter what I plan, the episode always seems to go somewhere that I didn't plan. So we'll see what happens as we go. Our new favorite segment, what have we been playing lately? As we've been working on my 10 for 10 in our group here, dreads the end of the year because I have my 10 for 10 that for some reason bully everybody into playing. Got City of Kings off of my 10 for 10. Did it in like two days. It was two or three days. There was one play prior to that. And you know, I complain about playing a game that lasts forever. But we played two gaming sessions of City of Kings, both that went almost five hours. It was good times. It was actually a ton of fun. See, that's what makes me believe that if we bring out some of these other games that he's had previous bad experiences with because of time, he could have a better experience with it. I've always reiterated that I do enjoy longer games. I just do not enjoy games where there's so much dead time between my turns. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which the City of Kings definitely is not that. But we did play a game of City of Kings that did not last five hours. <laughs> it was a good ten minutes or so. <laughs> I don't, it took us longer to set up the game. We played one of the single shot scenarios. We played a very hard one. We made it around the table once. And for some reason, we all allowed us to stay on one spot. Every single one of us died. Took our morale down four hits and we only had three to give it was a very somber experience to have gone from a f almost five hour experience down to one time around the table and we all lost it was very disappointing <laughs> yeah it was <laughs> and nathan we only dread your 10 for 10 this time of year because it's big games like this that get pushed off towards the end of the year that's all we play for a while big games that take up a lot of time are on your 10 for 10 but on the upside one of them is gloomhaven so I'm excited about Gloomhaven. Yeah, we've got a couple of plays in already. Down to five plays left. Then Logan and I, the other day, played another game of Star Wars Outer Rim. I think I won that one, didn't I? Oh, yeah. Hard. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Logan's had kind of a rough spell lately playing games. Um, Actually, thinking about it, when I was at Andy's house the other night, we played three or four games, three, three games, and I lost every single one, like, dead last. So it was pretty cool. Character building. A couple weeks back, we also started the app version campaign of Star Wars Imperial Assault. I'm really excited to get into, get some more plays in this year and into next year. Next year, we'll get into a regular one versus many campaign, which I'm excited. It's fun playing with the app. They actually do a really good job with the apps. There's just some elements that the app can't provide. I think it's good to play with a player as the Empire as long as you don't get too tied up into I have to win every single match. Because the game is designed to have some matches more geared towards the Imperials winning and some matches more towards the Rebels, which I think all games like that should be like that. We Talking... ran into that with Betrayal Legacy, right? Betrayal Where's Legacy. Some of those, some of those scenarios seem more weighted towards the traitor. And I haven't played Descent yet, but Dave and Andy, you guys have played it quite a bit. Yeah, Descent is not so much that. For the most part, as the players, you're going to win. But does somebody still play as the Overlord or you something? You can. 
it's been a long time since I've played it that way. But with the second edition of Descent, our overlord, I'm not sure that he ever won. He was 14. I don't know if that, you know, made any difference or I'm not. I'm sure that factored in there. The thing about Descent is nearly every time when you start, you feel like, no chance, Overlord's going to cream us in this. Whether it's app version or the other, you feel like you're going to get destroyed. It's a little bit different that way. Okay. I've had similar experience playing with Lord of the Rings Journeys Through Middle-Earth, playing that solo. As I play these campaigns, I enjoy that where it feels like there is no way I'm going to win this. Mm -hmm. But then as the game goes, some of those things fall into place. You end up doing a lot better than you thought you would. You don't necessarily always win, but you come back further than what you thought was going to be possible. Right. I think the app weighs it differently. There's certain aspects of the game that I noticed with Imperial Assault and with Descent, there's certain things that just don't work with the app. So the app omits those, but it adds some differences to make the monsters a little more difficult to fight. Different rounds, different monsters will have a special ability that they just get as part of their turn. The game plays differently with the app versus having an Overlord or someone playing the Empire. I've only done Descent with the app. The longer it takes you, you end up having Peril or whatever it's called, where every round you get poisoned or something. It adds extra stuff up for the fact that it's not a human running it. Imperial Assault, they have a lot of environmental issues that, that start to affect the heroes. Lord of the Rings also has a similar thing. Most of the events is darkness. You start to get a little bit more scared at dark. On Friday, Logan came over and we got to pull a game off my shelf that I have not played in at least 10 years. And that is Monsters Menace America. You never even heard of this game. <laughs> it's actually a pretty fun game. Published in 2005 by Avalon Hill. Each player takes on one of the monsters based on B-movie monsters like Godzilla or King Kong. Lots of different monsters to choose from. Each player picks a monster, and each player picks a branch of the military control as well. As the monster, you're going around and you're trying to stomp different locations. Depending on which location you stomp, you're going to gain some sort of benefit. If you stomp a city, depending on the size of the city, you're going to gain health. So if you stomp a large city, you get to roll three dice and you gain health equal to whatever you rolled. A very small city can maybe only give you one hit. Trying to build up your health, because at the end of the game, the monsters are going to fight each other. The last monster standing wins. So on your turn, you go through and you stomp. You can gain infamy, which you can spend infamy to get extra attacks. There's also mutation sites. You don't stomp that site, and you can only visit each site once, but then you draw a mutation card, which will give your monster a special power. Control the military, you're trying to block your opponents. Logan controlled the Navy, and he, it, was the Air it was the Air Force he had. And he had cruise missiles, and he would send these cruise missiles after me instead of Amara. My daughter Amara was playing with us. The thing with cruise missiles is that when you attack, if you roll a 1, then the monster mutates. And I got to mutate twice <laughs> from Logan's cruise missiles. Falls hand in hand with Logan's luck lately. <laughs> yeah, it really does. Yeah. That's the one we were playing it. One of those mutation sites with Amara, she got a mutation that at the end of every single round, her health would go right back up to her starting. And so I was trying to split my attacks to whittle down my opponents between the both of them, but then I didn't have enough resources to take Amara all the way down in one round. Then I had to focus on Andy. Andy kept getting all this extra health. Got to the point because I was focusing on him, he started focusing on me, and I'm like, well, I'm just going to make it easier for Amara in the final round. And then she lost. <laughs> <laughs> I did a good job. I whittled him down quite a bit. But... Yeah. At the final battle, you, you weigh in, and you, you look at each monster's health, then you battle. Whoever wins gains health equal to what other monster weighed in at. My daughter Amara had nine health going into the final battle, so when I defeated her, I gained nine health. And, and going into the final battle, I had one health. So that's true. <laughs> it did not take much. I forgot how much fun that game was. It had been about a decade since we had played it. We actually pulled a couple games off the shelf that we hadn't played for quite a while. Yeah, one of the other ones was Sewer Pirates. An assortment of like rodents and critters, like cockroaches and whatnot, scavenging through garbage in the sewers to find treasures. And so it's all about where you're at in the track, who gets to claim the best booty at the game. It was an interesting take on games like that. I don't know if I've played a lot of games that have that mechanic. You're competing about where you're at in the track. Three different boats in that game. There are four spots on each boat. A one, two, and a three. So one is at the very end of the ship. As you're moving towards the bow is the captain location. If you can get your person up to that location, then you become captain to set sail on your next turn. And you get the bonus tile and the first pick of all the loot that's available. Thematically, it's really fun. The loot, there's hamburgers, fries, Chinese noodles, canned goods, dolls, teddy bears. The best thing about the dolls and the teddy bears is that the bonus tile you get is a parrot. 
take these teddy bears and dolls hostage, but the parrot is the only way they can communicate to the child. You need to ransom their toys back to them. Thematically, it's just great. Each of the critters in the game has a special ability, and you don't play with all the critters. Each game can be a little bit different. So for example, the raccoon, if someone has a raccoon on the ship, in order to place and jump over that raccoon, you have to pay the person a card that matches the symbol of that ship. So that person can really lock up that ship on who can jump in front and possibly become captain by placing their raccoon. The weasel gets two actions instead of just one. Each of these different critters has a special power that really makes the game unique. And I'm glad we were able to pull that one out and play it. We were talking earlier off air about doing just a pirate themed day and game night with a whole bunch of different pirate games. Definitely will be on the list. And then one other game that I played, I just want to mention briefly because it's going to be more next week in our gift guide, but Scarabia, it's a tile placement game, like a puzzle at the same time. It was a really great game. It was really simple to sit down and be taught the rules, but to be able to get down and play, it was awesome. Playtime of 15 to 20 minutes? It's, Dave can it's push fast. it to like 30 to 40. So it... I certainly have not increased the time on this game. Or one that I'll, I'll mention is Faction Fighters. So Faction Fighter is actually a game that will be coming to Kickstarter on November 18th. This is the first game that we've gotten the opportunity to play prior to its Kickstarter release. It is a two-player game. Players compete in four different arenas, and they battle. You're going to fight against your opponent's faction fighters. Whichever faction has the highest power is going to win. What did you think of this, Dave? Pretty good. It's a head-to-head -head game, like you mentioned. Each player has their own deck that's unique, full of fighters and power orbs. And then there's a central deck, the area event deck. Flip over a card there so you can see what you are fighting for. Then you'll each place one card face down. That is going to be your scout. Scout's what is ahead. Reveal those at the same time. It's going to be a fighter. The fighters have a different strength rating on them up in the top left corner. Anywhere from 2 to 13. Each deck has a legendary that has a 13 strength. In the scenario that I played, flip over a card from the event deck. It has a strength. Collectively, the two of you want to beat that strength with your fighters. If you don't, one of you takes that card as a corruption. If ever a person has two corruption cards, they lose the game. But as long as the collective total beats that, then whoever played the most strength will take that card either to a discard pile or just to a score pile. But after sending forth your scouts, check out what your opponent played and then you get the opportunity to play bolster cards. Bolster cards are from your hand, more fighters of the same faction. There are some wilds count as any faction, or you can also play power orbs. Again, this is secret, how many cards, and you reveal them and then you resolve. Fighter cards usually have some powers that power orbs can activate. Very simple, took all of a minute and a half for you to explain the rules. Simple setup, explanation for sure. It's a good game. The nice thing about it is there's four different area event decks. Each of those area event decks plays very different. Like you were saying, you're teaming up to fight against an attacker, but only the strongest of the team up wins. Another one where you're battling over treasures. The difference that's there in each of the event decks gives the game quite a bit of variability so that you have those different experiences. And then you also have the option that players can draft which factions they include in their deck, so you have some variety. I think the game's very well done. Simple to teach, 15 to 25 minutes, play it again and again. That head-to-head -head combat is something that a lot of people really thrive, but we had a lot of fun with it. I took it home, played with my wife, who may know my wife. My wife is very competitive. She lost, and she was very disgruntled. We still had a lot of fun with it. She was looking forward to playing it again. I played the one time with you, Nathan, and watching Logan and David play, the difference with the events, the way the game played, I was impressed with how differently it played. I think it'd be fun to try the events just to see how differently that played. Even though the decks were the same, just having those events different. Yeah, each yeah. game felt a little different. Definitely worth checking out. Again, it hits Kickstarter on November 18th, so that should be next week. Definitely check it out. And that's Faction Fighters. And we also like to thank our friends at Thunderfinch Games for sending us this copy and letting us check it out. We had a lot of fun with it. And any new games that you guys are excited about? Andy, I know you can't wait to talk about your game, so why don't you go ahead and start us off. As far as new game announcements go, there is a new Descent Legends of the Dark coming out. When I first heard that there was a new Descent, I'm like, man, I just ton spent a ton of money on second edition, and we've been playing it, and it's been so much fun. The new Descent, it looks so good. They have really done some improvements on it. There's 3D terrain. It makes me really excited. Just the visual aspect of having 3D right. terrain. 
some of that terrain that you interact with during the game. Sounds like they have made some big improvements on the app. Options, options, options. Added a lot of options. In between scenarios, there's crafting, there's... You still get to go to town, you can upgrade your equipment. When you're in the scenarios doing your quests, they've changed some of the gameplay a little bit to where you can actually have three actions instead of two in the game. You always get a maneuver action, we'll always have movement points, and then you get two additional actions that you, you can attack, you can ready an action, which this is a new thing, ready in an action. Cards are double-sided, including your character card. So if you're ready in action, you get to flip your card over and gain a different ability to use. Once again, just different options adds a little bit more to what you can do with your characters and your items and your skills do the same thing. So I am really excited about this game. Unfortunately, I'm going to spend a lot of money on it again. <laughs> Not at first. It'll be a long, <laughs> drug out process. That's Andy. true. But that his wallets true. will be the happier for it at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Set to release next year. Descent Legends of the Dark. Also, just quickly, Wingspan. Oceana, new expansion, which uh, I still haven't even played my European expansion. What? I know there's so much new stuff. <laughs> Tough to get stuff that we have. But something I'm really excited about is Renegade Studio, who did their Power Ranger game for those who were into Power Rangers. Renegade Studio has expanded its licensing agreement with Hasbro, which means that we'll be seeing some more games from my childhood cartoons that i grew up on super excited they did a really good job with the power rangers got a lot of support for it uh, i haven't i haven't played have any of you guys played power rangers no, i don't I have think not, so nope. properties like gi joe my little pony my little pony now is that the one you're excited for no <laughs> that's what he was most excited <laughs> yeah, that's the one i'm most excited but gi joe was huge in my childhood probably longer than i should have been playing with gi joe <laughs> i was playing with gi joe transformers mm -hmm. transformers was huge but I am really excited for both those properties, the G.I. Joe and Transformers. They're also talking about that most of these properties will be getting role-playing versions, too. Oh, wow. Oh, cool. Might dust off the role-playing dice. Logan is already super excited about his My Little Pony role-playing. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking. My Little Pony campaign. So epic. So I know we've discussed this before, but I really hope that they do a good job with these and aren't just throwing a skin, sell it based on the fact that it's Transformers right. or G.I. Joe. I really hope they take the time and make solid games out of these because they really could be so much fun. Mm -hmm. That's my hope. I'm hoping that we get a Star Wars Outer Rim feel for this something that i was a little nervous for but after i picked up thoroughly enjoyed probably one of my favorite star wars board games take away tabletop games like armada and legion which are those tabletop versions also imperial assault one of my all-time favorite games and probably my all-time favorite star wars game and this is renegade games not fantasy flight it's not star wars it's kind of like Big Trouble in Little China. Pandering my feelings for some properties that were very near and dear to my heart growing up. Regardless, I'll be buying them. Hopefully, I won't be calling them the next week. So. <laughs> won't be the next week because it'll probably take us longer than that before we get to it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sitting right here. One of the games that came up when we were doing the research for this episode, one of the banners came up for a Hocus Pocus board game. And Hocus Pocus is one of my all-time favorite movies. Cult classic from like the 90s. Disney movie. It looks like it's its own unique game, so it's not just something that they slap the Hocus Pocus theme on, but I don't know how much effort that they put into it. The only thing that makes me hesitant about it, it has a nice price tag, so it's like under 20 bucks on Amazon. Almost worth the try, but we have so many other games on our list, probably pass it for now. We'll see if they tempt me next year. Is it just me? Does it seem like there's a fine line? If a game's too cheap on Amazon, I'm like, eh, maybe not, because maybe it's not that great, but... Then you have the other ones that are so outrageously expensive, I'm not paying that kind of money for a game. Yeah, Kickstarter doesn't have that feeling for me. That... No, Kickstarter's a little different. But... Like, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to do that. And Oh, Kickstarter, boom, here's my wallet. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Princess Bride game that's on there as well that's just recently come out. And that's got a lot of popularity too. I haven't looked at it too closely, but that property a lot of people are very fond of. So and That one's done by Ravensburger. They've done a good job with some game. Bites. And it's chapter games. They have six different chapters going through the story of The Princess Bride. Hopefully it's a great game. With those types, my sincerest hope is that they put together a good game with the theme that I really enjoy. This episode, we found so many new... It's unreal how many new games are out there right now. We might just have to name a bunch of them without talking too much in detail. Video gamers that are becoming more board gamers been quite a few games recently 
board games that have been designed around successful video games. So I know on Kickstarter just recently, it just finished Darkest Dungeons. It's like this gothic. The graphics in the game are like super intense even, but the Kickstarter, it's so intense, all the effort that they put into it. And it has to come from that market of video game people coming more towards board games. It looks great. And I'm sure board game players that just see the Kickstarter would be like, oh, that looks like a great game. But to think that it came from a video game would maybe baffle some people. Horizon Zero Dawn, you look at the components, look at the effort that they put into it, it's all based off of a video game. There's been a lot more of those video games that have come out. I don't know if it's necessarily trying to pull those people off of the computer. I don't think so, because I don't think you could do that. I don't think it's pulling them off the computer. I think it's that lures them to buy that game. It's just like what you were talking about with Star Wars earlier, is that these video game people that played 50, 60 hours in Horizon Zero Dawn to beat it, and then they see the title like, oh, I really enjoyed that game, and oh, here's a board game. Let's try it just because of the name. It's the same thing like with Big Trouble in Little China. It was a great game. What really got Nathan to back it was Big Trouble in Little China. No, you're absolutely right, because it had that Big Trouble. Yeah, I'm going to try it. And then it had all the cool miniatures, which I'm not necessarily a miniature-driven person, but that was kind of the icing on the cake, and I'm very pleased with that purchase. There's a lot of games that are out there that are acting on properties. There's a new Evil Dead 2, the board game. You said, Dave, we're going to probably just have to talk about a lot of these. We're not going to really be able to delve much into them. Cult Express has a, not expansion out, but a new take on that, the Cult Super Express. Tiny Epics has another game, Big Shocker. Tiny Epic Galaxies Blast Off, going off that Tiny Epic Galaxies series. Medici has a dice game. Medici is one of my favorite older games. Up to six players, always a ton of fun. Do you remember that, Dave? I love Medici. That was one of my favorite games for a long time. I've been such a long time since I've played it, but I probably still feel the same way. That's actually one thing that I'm super happy with. They're taking these classic games and then making them more accessible. The roll and write, just to be able to more easily convey this great classic game experience to people, I think is just a wonderful thing. The Bing Dice. Bing Dice is so much better, in my opinion, than regular Bang. I agree. I'm glad they took the opportunity to try something like that. Speaking of that, one of the new games is Mysterium Park, which is very similar gameplay to Mysterium which we have talked about several times on the podcast. More simplified setup, more simplified gameplay. So it falls in line with what we're talking about. More accessible, maybe a game that would be a little easier to get people that maybe are non-gamers to play. With that one, I'm hoping that they have all new artwork. You want to brush off the old Mysterium that you take the new artwork. I don't know if they'll have the same back, so it's not necessarily that you can mix them in, but at least play with different artwork. There's so much art in that game, but you still come across them quite a bit. Of well, you haven't even played this game yet. You don't know if it needs more art. It always needs more art because that is the most expensive thing that they have with games like this. The big thing that happened with Obscurio and One Key, each card having such detailed, amazing artwork, I bet it just costs so much money. That would be cool if they had the same card backs as Mysterium. Then you could bring your Mysterium cards into Mysterium Park or vice versa. That would be that Or would just be cool have if a really large one so you don't go see the same cards as much. Yes. Yeah, yeah that would be yes. very cool. Maybe we'll just have to get some sleeves. <laughs> yeah. Or you could just swap out with Mysterium cards. True. There's so another game out there. I'm going to mention one that's just a little different, not one that I think would normally get brought up. It's called Warp's Edge. For me, I like a lot of futuristic stuff. That's one of the reasons that caught my eye. In this game, you're a rookie pilot of the Force's Outer Rim. After a crucial battle, you're stranded far away from your fleet, lost and alone, and you're low on resources, and you have to jump through warp gate after warp gate, hoping to find the right combination home. The reason this one was unique and why I thought I would bring it up, it's a one-player game. For our group, obviously, it's not going to be hitting the table all the time, but mentioned before that lots of times we don't have somebody else to play with having a good option for a single player game is always good where was that game when we were in our last game of betrayal legacy <laughs> that would have been really nice andy got killed right at the start of the game and the game didn't end up being very quick either so he was yeah it was he it was, was a tough uh, elimination he was alone for a little while james was the traitor and he was trying to involve andy do you want to do you want to help me be the traitor <laughs> you take one of my minions <laughs> such a 180 flip considering the exact same thing happened to james in imperial assault so um, you were talking about this one player game dave uh-huh. There was a new game that the game was not on my radar at all. But as I was looking at it, saw the time limit, and I figured this game was for you. 
<laughs> and so this is actually a game that my brother, Kit, would be really big into. He loves these historical battle games. The Fold a Gap, the Battle of Word the Center. It's a one to four player game by Compass Games. It's actually one to four plus players. Guessing that means you can have as many play you want. But the time frame on this, a meager two hours to 50 hours. <laughs> that game is just right up your alley. Wait, Nathan, it doesn't say two hours per game. It's two hours per game turn. Oh, per game turn? Yes. That's that, even better. When you go into the details, it says two hours per game turn. And now Dave says challenge accepted. <laughs> yeah historical battle game that my brother would really love just the time frame alone dave made me think of you three thousand minutes so insane (laughs) games that we've picked up that have been added to the shelf of shame cosmic colonies which looks really good i love that it goes up to five players it's by scott alms who did heroes of land air and sea and a lot of those tiny epic games pandemic legacy season zero which, Which is super thematic for the year, so you should just pick it up just based off of that. Well, you should just pick it up because it's Pandemic Legacy. Season 1, Season 2. We're almost through Season 1. I'm sad again to concluding a Pandemic Legacy game. So far, I think it's been possibly my favorite Legacy game. I really enjoyed Gloomhaven. Pandemic Legacy has been superior. so much fun. It has been a great game. I love the game. I think it's a ton of fun. This is my third round going through it. Eliminate myself from a lot of the decisions so that I don't Definitely. influence you guys, allow you to make your own decisions. And it's kind of funny. This game has gone quite a bit different than the other two experiences I've played. I'm looking forward to Pandemic Season Zero. I have a copy for us to play and a copy for my wife and I to play. We'll see who gets to it first. I'm betting it's your wife. Considering that we have a huge stack of games to get through Slash Season 2. Yes. We've picked up Fort Mariposa. Picked up Root. We'll hopefully be talking more later. All of its expansions. Oh, you got all of it. Complete nice. Root. It's going to be a lot of fun. So those are just a few of the games that are coming out. One last game that's just come out. A game called The Alpha. An interesting concept on a game. Playing part of a wolf pack. On your turn, you're going to stalk, chase, resolve combat between other wolf packs, advance your wolf down the food track. Plays over five weeks, which are five different rounds. The wolf pack with the most food will be declared the alpha. It's an interesting concept, but I really love time on it, 20 to 45 minutes. It's something that's really easy for our group to get to the table. So real quick, since we've pretty much ran out of time, the Kickstarters, there's one that I'm hoping that I have some extra funds to back. It's Spectre in Vox. It's a 3D haunted house escape room designed by this guy who designs escape rooms in London. He talks about in the Kickstarter what's so horrible about this year in COVID-19 is it's locked a lot of escape rooms. He got together with his buddies that designed these escape rooms and designed this laser printed wood, super intense, almost like a dollhouse. It's like a 3D, three feet by three feet massive haunted house they put on your table. Depending on your backer level, it includes lighting for the house so that way they tell you to turn off the lights so that you're only playing with the lights from the haunted house. It looks like such a crazy. Looks pretty awesome. Crazy it looks intense amazing. game. Yeah. Really hoping that I can move the funds around to back this game. I'm imagining that it's going to be a kick in the pants just for shipping. Hopefully it breaks down. They did say that it does break down flat for storage. Okay, good. In the initial Kickstarter, about six hours of gameplay, depending on which level you back. They're planning to download more adventures. You can use the same haunted house for other adventures for more content. With such a crazy, amazing looking haunted house board game, I'm, I'm hoping that there would be more opportunities to use it. It reminds me of like Chronicles of Crime, where you can use that same content and make different scenarios, but still fall back on that same content. Should be pretty cool. It looks really cool. And it's an excuse to go buy a Mycroft. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really hoping that I have spaced my budget for it, because it is such a great looking Kickstarter. There's also some other cool Kickstarters that we're not going to have time to talk about. Dire Alliance Horror, which ends on November 17th, has some pretty cool miniatures, Dave. I know you love your miniatures. That looks really cool. Crimson Woods, social deduction game. Skeptics looks good. Mm, And you're skeptical about... I'm a little skeptical on that one. And this other one that looks really cool is Endless Winter, the Paleo-Americans. 
One to four player game. The game takes place in North America around 10,000 BC. Players guide the development of their tribes. Over the course of games, tribes migrate and settle new lands, establish cultural traditions, hunt and build and build megalithic structures. It's a worker placement deck building game. Take some of those mechanics that we love and uses them in a different way, Dave. So it's kind of right up your alley. I like it. But that's Endless Winter Paleo-Americans. And I really like the artwork. It reminds me of Raiders of the North Sea and Paladins of the Western Kingdom. It has very similar artwork, in fact. And that looks pretty cool. So that is our November's news. So that is our November's news. I did it again. That is our (laughs) news for November. We have skipped a lot just because there's just so much stuff going on this month with new game releases. Hopefully it's because of the holidays. But either way, I'm happy about it because there's just so much stuff to look forward to. Andy, Dave, good job. Because your holidays. Oh, sorry. (laughs) Well, you know. (laughs) Take credit for it. People always thank them when they don't have to go to work one day. I thank them. (laughs) You're welcome. But until next time, we'll see you playing all those new games at the game table. You're going to need a Minecraft. (laughs)